Hey, bud. Hey, Paul. How's it going? Good, man. Thanks for setting everything up. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm thinking about this stuff that we've been talking about. It's it's an interesting concept when you bring it into the steep, steep. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Jenny. Hey, Deb. Uh, where's Deb? The slider over. Right oh, here. Deb, She's hey, in there. Everybody. We're going on with this whole conversation. I didn't even realize you guys were in the room. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. No, awesome. Thanks for thanks for having me. This is this is going to be fun. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your time, Deb. Absolutely. Good to see you, Deb. I'll pop off so y'all can talk. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, she she organized the whole thing, so. It's really hard. <laughs> yeah, but she it's has those skills that we don't, so thank you, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, do, do you know, have you met Zoe Mavis and Paul Manlin? No. Okay, well, Zoe Mavis, <laughs> training director here at Big Sky, Montana. Awesome. Hey, Paul, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. And Paul Manlin is the adult manager of the, of the snow sports school. Nice yeah. meeting you guys. You yeah. as well. Yeah. And so you know Zoe's on, now on the team, on the National Alpine team. And Paul is a level four coach and has, has raced and, and coached at a high level. So um, I thought they were two great people to bring in to talk about hips and how they relate to the turn and to pick up where we left off this morning when we were texting madly with each other. <laughs> that was a fun conversation this morning, Chris. I loved it. And yeah, you know, that, that video that came out, I know that it sparks a ton of interest and uh, I like to have the opportunity to talk about it because, you know, things, things can just sort of spiral all spin out all over the place. And so I think it's nice to be able to kind of give some context with folks and and yeah, yeah. understand where things are coming from. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it, and I and I love the way you were talking about just on on a simple movement pattern like going down a cat track and thinking about how the hips are moving through the arc of the turn. Yeah. Can you catch catch these guys up on what we were talking about on that very basic yeah. level? You know, I um uh for a long time i mean probably 12 15 years on catwalks have been thinking about my hips and and stroking the turn with my hips thinking okay i i i do i got my edging movements happening i'm working my rotary but what more can i bring into play and and just isolating the hips and focusing on the hips uh, and it, it's really keeping the skis quite, I mean, the hips quite square, very square uh, through the turn. And I've been doing that for, like I said, for the last 10, 12, 15 years. And it's been such an amazing feeling. I have absolutely loved it. And I've known that something is there, but I wasn't sure how I wanted to go about teaching it. And very rarely do I teach it because there's so many other things that are kind of more important that we need to make sure that that's lined up and and yeah. that folks are understanding and and so I've I've rarely gone there with people. And then when I was interviewing Coop, you know, Cooper Puckett, 20 years old, US ski team on the C team and he he's a little bit of a mad scientist like he is way into it. He likes to go deep into technical talk. He was really excited that I had some questions for him. And he was the one that brought it up out of the blue. I didn't bring it up at all. And he said, you know, Deb, I want to tell you about this thing. And, and then the rest is on the video, right? Talking about keeping his hips square, uh, really when he's skiing GS. And I didn't take it further. How much is he thinking about it in free skiing or in slalom or anything like that? And um, he talked about some situations when he thought it really helped him. And then I ch chimed in because I was so thrilled, like, whoa, yeah, you're speaking my language, Coop. That's exactly where I'm at. And so it, it just was a wonderful moment. And, um, and so for me, it's gotten me thinking about it more on the front burner right now, not so much on the rear burner, but the front burner. Uh, and one thing that when I was talking to Chris this morning, 
and I, and so I'll just talk a bit about it and then you guys sort of questions, chime in, whatever. Um, you know, when, when we're talking with instructors and when we're talking about our guests, uh, we, we talk about these very large topics for people to be able to understand. For example, are the hips a part of the upper body or are the hips a part of the lower body? And I think we've come to this place that's been very black and white. The hips are this, the hips are that. And I've revisited this idea, and I'm not the smartest one in the room, but I have my personal experience. So I've revisited this idea after the, after the video with Coop of thinking of my hips independent from my upper torso, that my hips can be working with my lower body. They can remain square through the turn, the power I get from that, the stacking that I get from that, the way I can get the ski tip to continue to just bite in the snow and 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 finish up that turn in 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 such a a sweet way. Um, but then the upper torso kind of working on this different plane as Coop talked about. Uh, that is a nuance that's probably exploding people's heads because it's not fitting in this black and white context of the hips being a part of the upper body or the hips being a part of the lower body. And I think it's interesting because skiing is that way, you know, that, that there's a lot of nuances about skiing and it depends so much on your skill level. Uh, I think that has a ton to do with it in terms of our separation of body parts. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, that's all I'll say with it right now, but I think it's a really fun conversation. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, Deb, you, you mentioned that uh, there were certain circumstances where, where that really helped him out a bit. What what kind of, like, was it a tactical decision that he would make? Or was it, like, what, what were the circumstances where he felt more success with something like that? Well, you, you'd, you'd have to go back and look at the video. And I also did an Instagram short, so it's about a minute, 30 seconds. So it's easy for people to find that on my Instagram, the, the real short version, mm -hmm. and then the longer version that's in the YouTube video that I made. Um, he was he was talking about just basic stacking through the turn, keeping up with his skis, not falling behind, and just for kind of his supreme power. He also talked about um, uh, working those hips through the turn, keeping them square, that it better positioned him, you know, he was talking about, you know, when that ski can just get excessively loaded up and almost slingshot you out of a turn. Mm -hmm. Anything beyond that, it would need to be a longer conversation with Coop because I didn't ask him follow-up questions. Got it. As it relates to myself in skiing it and using it. I mean, I, I don't have the strength of Cooper Puckett. I don't have the strength that I used to have 20 years ago. 30 years ago. So for me personally, when I'm, when I'm working on, uh, working on a carved turn, working with the side cut of the ski, I am on a blue run, uh, a gentle blue run. I'm working on it a lot often when I'm on a catwalk. So I'm not getting huge force underfoot, but I, I feel, feel the stroking through the turn and the release. So that's when I'm focusing on it and using it. Got it. And, and are you talking about the hip coming past square or, or just coming up to square or not past square, not, yeah, yeah. not rotating right. beyond at all, but just stroking through and just yeah. staying nice and square. And so the outside hip and I, 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 I do teach to the hip flexors at times. So you, you've got your hips and we've got our outside hip flexor and our inside hip flexor and that inside leg, the inside joint, ankle, knee, and hip. Uh, as that inside leg is flexing, then that inside hip flexor becomes more compressed, more flexed. And I, I often think of the outside hip flexor longer, stronger, and driving the hip to square and there I have a very long extended outside hip flexor. 
and the the power that comes with it 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 is is really a neat feeling and i have taught that to some people and it's been very very helpful when i'm teaching to the hips working with their hip flexors yeah it's an interesting thing that you bring up cuz i was literally talking about this the other day and you know i think commonly this is when we're coaching high level instructors, like towards a level three or something like that, right? As they're trying to figure out a, a way to move inside. And actually I was telling Chris that I'm exploring this myself, um, that a common thing that happens is that like inside hip leads them in, right? And that outside hip gets like lost behind and then they don't have the power to the outside ski. So I agree being able to like, lengthen and open that outside hip like certainly allows you to direct a little bit more pressure that outside ski through the fall line and get the you know the energy from the ski but i i agree towards square right because oftentimes we see people move in a way that brings their hip inside and almost like the inside leads and then they're not in a place where they can manage the energy on the outside ski absolutely 100 percent and it, you know, if you think like, like my perspective and we all have different perspectives, right? And for, in terms of my frame of thinking, I use the, the Alpine ski racer and the high end Alpine ski racer as the research and development, uh, field. And because you know, they can't get away with being a little sloppy here, a little sloppy there. And we know in skiing, you can get to the bottom of the hill fast. You can get to the bottom of the hill and carve. You can get to the bottom of the hill successfully. But are are you as on it as you could be? And the World Cup ski racing is, is sort of that ultimate to a degree of, of research and development. They've got it so finely tuned and and then for me what what the way i view it is taking that research and development and then working it down through the levels to the high performance turn to a basic parallel down to a wedge um and seeing you know where this can all all apply and in what situations you know whether it's steeps or moguls or crud short radius turn whatever it is that we're after but it, but it is true, I think, to to what you're saying, that people are are quite hippie. They get a little bit twisty. They get away with it. It's fine. And also, it might be a little more one size fits all when we can be more nuanced than that. Yeah. Yeah. I love. I love it. I love. I love this conversation. I love talking about those nuances and in you know, things that we can actually feel out on the hill we're playing. I was thinking about that today. And I, and I took that idea of going down a cat track. I went down pacifier um, and I'm just making little subtle moves all the way down. And this is a green, like an easy green run yeah. road. And, uh, and it was just, I got the sensation. And then in the afternoon, I went up on the upper mountain and I went up the tram and I was skied some pretty steep terrain up there. And I was thinking, you know what, there's a, there's an application. And the application is when you, when you open your hip up and you're, you're getting longer through that, you know, your hip area, you've got a big range of motion that you can deal with pressure and terrain and snow conditions. And I think if you, if you get up there and you just start to, to immediately start to turn with your legs and with the hips and the fall line, you limit yourself pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, that, I mean, I, I was, as I was thinking about that today, but the question I have to, um, and Deb, when you and I were on the team, we, we, we talk about stuff like this, the little nuances and little ideas. And um, now Zoe's, you know, job on the team is to take content and spread that content around the U.S. and go to different mountains. Zoe, I guess the question would be to you, what, you know, when you're, when you're going and doing clinics and, and that type of stuff comes up, does that fit in with the national standards, you know, or the national, the national direction? I, I mean, I think, uh, I, I love that this is the question you asked me since 
We're so Deb for context, we're going uh, into another trial process this year. Um, and, uh, oh, and we lost Chris, which is great, but, um, so we're going into another trial process and we have to write an article as part of that part of the application. And my article literally is, uh, information needs context for it to create relevance. Um, and so like you ask a question like that, and like you said, I feel like it depends on who you're coaching and when and where do I think that your hip should be square with your feet in the fall line? Absolutely. And I think that a hundred percent aligns with you know, what we believe, um, is, you know, good skiing. Um, and I think to your point, it's nuanced how we coach it, right? Because you have to have the context of like what we're trying to achieve on the ski. Right. And what's, what's the reason for the information of driving the hip or whatever we're doing. And to your point, I would certainly coach it in a, in a place that we're trying to direct some more pressure, maybe bend the ski more, and get in the, in an alignment place, especially in the fall line, uh, that we're maybe not achieving. So. Yeah. Yeah, You know, it's, it's interesting because I, I want to play with this further and see if, and where it applies when I'm not trying to bend the ski more, I'm just thinking about my balance, my effective balance. And um, so I, for me personally, because I don't have the answer and, it, you know, and wanting to kind of test throughout in various situations, the way, Chris, you took it up into the steeps today mm-hmm. um, and and test it when I'm using more rotary and and what's going on there. And, you know, I don't have the answers to that. It It's an interesting experience. Um uh, when I, um, was trying out when, when I was getting my PSIA certifications and that, I don't know, I mean, 25, maybe even 25 years ago or so, let's say, right. I was going through my level one, let my level two, let my level three. And then I, I kept going up to the national team. And when I was training for my level one and level two and learning from PSIA, the big statement at the time was extend to release what are those balloons happening behind me <laughs> chris what? fellows did you make that happen what are you doing i know what I... are you doing you're messing with me okay but here's the thing it was extend to release and i remember thinking wow that's that's an interesting statement i mean and i i think that statement was across the country and I, I was an accomplished skier. I knew skiing at a cellular level. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, I don't have to extend to release, but if that's what you want me to do, that's what I'll do. And that was my introduction to, to all of this. And, and through my career with PSAA, that gave me so many tools, so many important tools that I use every single day, teaching people technical, right? Um, I, I, I was experienced enough in the world of skiing that I would take nothing as gospel, extend release or whatever. Uh, and we could even say, are the, are the hips part of the upper body or the lower body? I, I'm not smart enough to tell you what it is, but I'm not going to take it for gospel. I'm going to go out there and, and play with it. And I can tell you, I can make turns with my hips being square as a part of my lower body as a part and separate from what my upper torso is doing. Um, so I, you know, generally speaking with a, with a large organization as PSIA, 30,000 plus members, um, and, and those members who don't have much experience as we do, they're going to listen to every word we say, and they're, they're going to take it. And, um, so I'm, I'm aware of that and I want to be very careful and, uh, and about what I'm saying, cause I don't want to lead people astray, but I'm also not going to take anything as, as a gospel. This is what it is, because I can tell you from my experience, 10 years later, it's going to change. Now, what I know from the world cup research and development sort of things, what changes with them 
is because it's not somebody has this fun idea and it, it, it's changing with equipment. It's changing from physics. It's changing from strength and alignment. That's why these things are changing. They're pushing the limits. What can we get away with? Where do things break down? Uh, and it's not so much theoretical as much as it is practical and just to the clock and, and we're testing it here. Yeah. 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 I think that's like super valid and it's, it's just so funny. It's I, my, the article that I wrote is very consistent with that. Like, you know, we all know that person, that pride member of PSIA who got some feedback at one point, maybe from a team member and they took it as gospel and they ran with it. And now like my example is like directing pressure to the outside ski early in the turn, right? Now that person is moving up the hill first before they then have to move down the hill, right? So it's gone to such an extreme that like they don't have enough context to create relevance to why they're doing the piece, right? And so I think that it's, like you said, you know, we have a lot of experience. So we kind of like understand the nuanced pieces, um, something I would love to, and I think we are moving in that direction as an association, but I think being the association we are having as many members as we do and having the influence we do and in, in how skiing is talked about in the U S um, I think it's really important that we do it in a frame of mind, understanding that we need to create context for people so that information is relevant towards outcomes and that we don't say something or information is not skewed in a way where someone all of a sudden is going to be like, well, this is all the you, that you have to do to, to ski, right? Just like you said, extend, like extend to release. It's a thing that you can do. Is it the only thing you can do? Absolutely not. Is it the thing that I want to do some places? Probably not. Um, but you know, I think, I think that's the point is, is the context piece. And I think I would love to explore more of how we as an association can do that better. Yeah, well, that's... and that's, that's why we're talking because uh, we're, it's lifelong learning and we're, we're all on that quest and we're all discovering and, and we're all discussing with one another and having new experiences and, um, use, using these new ideas and new situations. And, um, this is not fixed, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's not fixed. Well, I, I'm sorry. I had to jump off. I had a, a, a FaceTime call with a toddler there. So, <laughs> um, but I think to, uh, to, to Zoe's point, you know, I, 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 I you know, I love what you said earlier, Deb, and I, and I love what Zoe said, you know, about the, you know, we need the context. And I can just imagine, like, uh, you know, we all know a handful of U16 coaches that are going to be coaching it solely, well, Deb Armstrong said this now, so it's all in the hips now, you know, and no more. Well, um, listen, and, and, listen, and, and, I, I, what, but let me, let me say uh, that, that, you know, if any, you know, it's, I don't take that as my responsibility. No, nor should other you. Yeah, 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 for other sure. people's, other people's inability to, yeah. to understand skiing in it with more context. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. But I think what, make, what makes the difference is this, this is an example, say you're level three and you're going to go to a level three exam. And one of the assessment activities is uh, pivot slips in a corridor. And in the that assessor examiner's mind is, well, that person better be turning their legs and their hips better be staying right on the line down in that corridor. Or if I see the hips swinging with the with the skis, that's a fail. So that's an example of how somebody could, you know, run. Well, you know, I heard this and, you know, I've been practicing this way. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, that's why we don't, that's why we don't score assessment activities like that anymore, Chris. <laughs> you can't pass or fail a pivot slip anymore <laughs> because of those things, right? Biases, biases yeah. get in the way, right? Yep. And yep. hundred percent. Like 
part yeah. of the whole is can you do you have the ability to separate at some point in some time to affect a ski performance right yeah <laughs> point, point taken <laughs> you know so so what i i mean just so what i really enjoy what i enjoy is to find very very accomplished folks um that represent a broad spectrum. Cooper Puckett, he's the ski racer. He has this thing to say, and I'm like, wow, I'm with you. I'm listening. This is really interesting. And then, you know, the the bump ski, I mean, the, the professional bump skier, they're gonna have a different take. And wow, I'm listening. And then the the that free ski, free ski kind of all mountain, just their touch and nuance and everything. Um, wow. I'm listening and, you know, finding those people. And, and in my mind, I have my Armstrong filter, you know, and we're, there's going to be context and I'm going to, I'm going to listen to what they're having to say. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'm going to, maybe I agree. Maybe I don't, I'm going to go out and give it a try. See what I think. Take it for a spin. Um, and you know, in my mind, that's how it's always sort of churning in, in my experience. Deb, when you were, when you were a young ski racer coming up, did you have an Armstrong filter or did you think that that was an innate thing or did you have to develop it over going down some dead ends? I 100% had had an Armstrong filter because everyone in the world had something to say and I had to filter it all out. Maybe it made sense to me. Maybe it didn't. All that I knew is with what they had to say, did it make a difference for me as a skier? Did it make me faster? Did it make me more agile? Did it take me where I needed to go? And there were there were probably only five or six things ever coached to me that I really stuck and that I really remembered. But I learned in different ways. I followed. I'm following Tamara McKinney and you know, following my teammates. Um, so yeah, I I gained an appreciation at a young age to be very careful with what organizations had to say, with what people had to say. I have a brain, I'm going to listen, and then I am going to decipher. And I'll tell you, that's what Cooper Puckett does. Cooper Puckett is not taking anything that anybody has to say with how him taking it in, putting it through his Cooper Puckett little mechanism and see what comes out on the other side. You know, and and I uh I and I think that's important. And I I try to tell kids that and I try to tell guests that I teach that in time it's important that you start to have this filter and um yeah was was that hard when you were when you were on the team when you're the coaches you know on any team right we've all been on teams um sometimes there's a group think thing that goes on and when that goes on it's like oh yeah well this coach said this and and all these athletes and these yeah people saying this and it's like well maybe i'm the i'm the odd man out or odd woman out and so what's the you know how, yeah how do you that no, I think that's really interesting, Chris, and good. My internal culture has never been groupthink, ever. In high school, I was an independent thinker. On the US ski team, I was an independent thinker. While on the PSAA national team, I was an independent thinker. To this day, you know, my YouTube channel, I'm an independent thinker. And and I like to cherry pick, in my view for 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 my purposes what are those things that i i so appreciate so cherish from what psaa has offered me same with us ski team and and their coach training and and then from my own experience and then what i what i seek out um so i do you know i am pretty skeptical of a group think mentality. I like collaboration, love collaboration, love conversing. But when people come up to me and say, well, this is what PSIA has to say. Well, I'm thinking to myself, well, that either works for me or it doesn't work for me. I don't really care. 
Yeah, I mean, but it, and again, it's not, there's this is a tryout year, and there's a, a lot of people that are going. I know you were just in uh, Rocky Mountain looking at some try routers, and um, there's a lot of hoops that everybody has to jump through. It, and it's really hard. And I'll tell you what, I was at the tryouts for the selections for Rocky. And, you know, I asked the selectors the question, where, are, where is this group coming from technically? Because it is confused. It is a mishmash. It is confused. And the people coming to these tryouts, in my view, were not real tight from a technical standpoint. There was some confusion there. It, it, there wasn't as much clarity as I would have expected from that very large pool of people going to national tryouts. That's not the applicant's fault. That's That comes from the leadership. That's from the highest up. Hence, a video that I made not long ago to PSIA, is it time for Centerline 2.0, which was kind of a catchy title. But that's where that came from. <laughs> that is a very catchy title. Like that? Yeah. I think you could should copyright it right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll I'll tell you for me with this because nothing's fixed in my brain. This is all continue. I mean, I'm going to be going up on the hill, you can be sure, and I'm going to be playing with this in all situations. I'm going to be playing it with it with my rotary. You know, where does this break down? How far can I push this? How far can I get away with this? Oh, I'm very clear where it's awesome. Cooper Puckett was talking about it. My question is, does it go broader than that? And and that's for us to kind of explore. Yeah. My gosh, thank you so much for your time, Deb. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to chat with us on this. How cool is this? Yeah, this is really cool. Thanks, Deb, for the time. It was wonderful to meet you even over Zoom. And yeah. uh, excited with everything that, uh, you're doing out in Taos with Humoria and everything like that too. So super fun stuff. So yeah, thanks you guys. If yeah, you're, it was a fun day today. If you're ever in Big Sky, we'd uh, we'd love to go spin a couple laps with you. I'd love it. I love it. I love it, fellows. That in the most random times we could just pick up the phone and pick up where we were ten years ago, twelve years ago, and hardly say hello, but get right into it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's good. Uh, thanks awesome. so much, Deb. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye, Deb. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Chris. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.